Hi everybody, I'm Drew and welcome to Lane Changers. I'm here with Abby from Misfits Market. Thank you for being here, man. This is great. Thanks for having me. The Excited. inaugural episode. This is, uh, this is going to go down in history. Amazing. So tell us about Misfits Market. Yeah, so uh, in theory, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty simple concept. We rescue uh, ugly misfit produce uh, and more broadly other foods from farms across the country. We repackage it and we sell it directly to consumers. The idea is we can sort of tackle this massive food waste problem that exists today and help people get access to healthy, affordable food delivered to their doorsteps. Um, so we currently service about 23 states uh, okay. on the East Coast, Northeast, okay. um, and, and service uh, you know, a pretty large chunk of the population in the U.S., work with about 100 different farms across the country to, to rescue produce that would otherwise be thrown out. It's, it's really exciting. I mean, I know we were talking off camera. Any, any business that creates value by, by eliminating waste and things that would otherwise be thrown away is, is certainly near and dear to our heart. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about the food uh, supply chain in this country? What, how do things get wasted? Is it a large percentage of food that winds up you know, in the bin? Yeah, I mean, the, the numbers are staggeringly large, I would say. Um, it's, it's, it's about 40 million tons per year in the U.S. alone. Now you have to think about that a little bit, 40 million tons. Yeah, 40 million I'll tons. give you a couple other variants. Is that 80 that. billion pounds? Am I doing the math right? It's, uh, it's yeah, 100 billion plus pounds of produce. You know, you convert that to a dollar amount. It, those are such massive numbers. There's so many zero, trailing zeros. It's tough to actually kind of like fathom how large it is. Yeah. It's something like two to $3,000 per household in the U.S. Uh, of food that goes to waste. So if, if we were to repurpose even a fraction of that, uh, you could essentially feed everyone who was starving uh, you know, in, in, you know, in, in the entire world. So it's, it's a very large amount of food that goes to waste. Uh, we've, we've interviewed farms as well that have that said somewhere between a third to 40% of the food they grow doesn't actually make it to consumers and gets wasted somewhere uh, in, in the supply. So there's, there's two different components of waste. There's things that households throw out Correct. and there's things that are rejected at the field. Right. Wow. They, they, we, we, we think about it, the, if you look at the food value chain, you have, you have household level waste, restaurant level waste, which is consumer side, right. and then everything that's upstream in the supply chain. Um, farm level, uh, on the logistics layer, which you, know, you guys do a sure. lot of work in, there's all this stuff that you know, loads that get rejected, uh, and therefore the trucks are routed to landfills and, and dump stuff out. So there's an incredible amount. Yeah, it's, it, you go from shipping strawberries to making jam, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I mean, man, that's a, that's a really cool business. Congratulations for doing something that is Thank both, uh, obviously from the capital you've raised, obviously it's a, an attractive business, but it does good too. So how does one get into this business? Do you come from a, a farming background? Like how did, how did you think of this? How did you ideate it? And how yeah. did you begin executing? Yeah, uh, I, I wish I came from a farming background. No. <laughs> Do you uh, though? It's a pretty yeah, tough life. <laughs> it is. Uh, the story is, is you know, uh, less romantic, I would say, but uh, it's kind of a practical founding story. So I, in a previous life, I worked in finance and I actually worked in distressed, uh, distressed credit investing. Uh, and uh, we looked at a lot of different businesses and basically my job was to look at businesses that everyone else hated and to try to figure out a way to, to, to create value from those businesses. Okay. Uh, and one big segment I spent time in uh, was food logistics, food storage, and, and anything that was supply chain related. Um, and so that was my initial foray and I started to see kind of at the, at the farm level, at the distributor level, and at the 3PL level, how much stuff, how much shrink there was, how much waste there was uh, and to me I was like hey there's got to be something someone could do with this product and I, I did a lot of research and no one was doing anything with the product uh, and then at the same time so I, I, uh, I went to school in Philadelphia okay uh, our company's uh, ops HQ is in Philly okay same time you know I noticed all these folks in Philadelphia that lived in food deserts didn't have access to, um, you know, forget organic produce, didn't have access to fresh produce, period. Yep. Uh, no grocery stores. Um, you have bodegas that would sell cheesesteaks but didn't have apples. So I was like, there's a fundamental supply and demand mismatch here, and I think there's a way of taking this food inefficiency and turning it into affordability for consumers. Now, in fairness, I think they sell cheesesteaks just about everywhere in Philly. Sure. But, but the, yeah, but yeah, the exactly. point the point notwithstanding, that is, um, that is, that is really cool, man. So, so, I mean, we've got some stuff here. Like, so how does the, what's the business model do? Is it, is it a subscription? Do you buy individual produce? How do you work with your customers? Yep. So, um, you get boxes of produce 
it's on a subscription. Uh, it's a very flexible subscription. Our, our philosophy is, you know, we're not going to force you into a subscription interval because if you get boxes of produce showing up to your doorstep, you don't want it. Uh, kind of defeats you know, the purpose. Defeats right? the purpose of food waste, right? So it is a subscription. Um, the idea is it can replace your, your your core produce component of your grocery shopping every week. Got it. Um, so you can subscribe to either a small box or a large box. A small box we uh, affectionately call the mischief box. That's okay. The mischief box right there. Okay. Um, the large box is a madness box because uh, uh -huh. it's, it's a lot of food. Yep. Uh, and you can subscribe either weekly or every other week uh, in terms of intervals. And we uh, we allow customers to customize their box as well. So we'll show you okay. a big list of everything that's available, okay. um, you know, the 200 items, and you can pick whatever. So you uh, don't have to get stuck eating radish and cauliflower things you don't like. You don't, and beets, like. You don't yeah, have to get squash and beets every week. Uh, and then we actually have a, a very new initiative rolling out soon called the Misfits Market Marketplace, um, whereby we are tackling food waste on a on a broader uh, on a broader level, yep. and the idea is that there's all this produce that goes to waste. And I, we can talk about the produce in a second, uh, but there's also food waste in other categories. Um, so if you look at dairy, dairy alternatives, you look at packaged items like cereal bars, uh, nuts, grains, lentils, soup cans, all this stuff goes to waste for other irrational reasons in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, so we're launching this thing called the marketplace whereby customers can essentially add uh, other grocery items that would have gone to waste as well into their Misfits Market box. Makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and, and again, you know, with some of our customers, as to your point, to your point, sometimes the, the reasons that people throw things out have nothing to do with the quality yep. of the stuff. And you know, maybe if you're looking for a perfect experience, sure. But as you say, for for those folks who are disadvantaged or otherwise can't afford the the best, you know, how do we give them access to exactly? It? Like you look at this pepper, for example. Um, it's it's a we'll call it like a sun 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 damaged sun or, sun kissed sun kissed the marketer pepper. in me exactly. would call that sun kissed, sun -kissed pepper. <laughs> and it's also shaped a little bit funky but besides yep. that it's sun kissed and because it's a combination of green uh, orange and red this gets sorted out at the farm level so when they when they're when they're picking these out of the out of the field some farms actually don't even harvest them because the cost of harvesting and storage is so high they'd rather just, just let, let it, it let it fertilize let it the ground yeah um, which releases methane gas which is terrible for the environment etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, we come in there and we say hey we have a lot of customers who would pay uh, you know a, a cheaper rate to buy a cheaper price to buy these sun kissed or sun damaged peppers yep. harvest them we'll pay the farmer the consumer gets a discount and we win as well. I think you're missing an opportunity to market this as a premium product. You can have green, yellow, and red on your plate from just <laughs> one pepper with th with this. So yeah. that's that's an opportunity to upsell. Yep. Um, this is really cool, man. So of course, um, to sort of think about it from from uh, from our perspective, the the world of logistics is complicated enough, and the world of produce logistics is is massively complicated. And so now you're taking that, and you're presumably making it even harder because you're taking products that have less viable time left on them when they come into your possession. So how did you how did you think about both? building the logistics infrastructure to be able to do this and then also just you know from a scaling perspective how do you think about you mentioned you're in 23 states how do you think about opening new markets you know how do you do, is it a form of investment you know how do you think about the growth of the business yeah so you know, i like to say internally we to the consumer we're a produce business or grocery store the back end we're a logistics business at the end of the day it's, it's an operationally intensive logistics business um, especially when it comes to the transportation component the right down in the outbound piece um, i think overall our strategy has been there are folks that have built pretty complex logistics infrastructure that we should partner with right uh, and, and it's basically one of the things we do with you guys right it's at the end of the day the, the thesis is that um, we don't want to be figuring out all of that, you know, the inbound logistics from hundreds of farms across the country and optimize, you know, full truck loads and make sure that, uh, you know, the pickup times work and the routing is optimized, et cetera. We know that there's partners like yourselves that have done that and, yeah. and, and have specialized in that. So a big part of our strategy there is, is partnering with the right folks, you know, like the Transfixes and, and saying, hey, um, the inbound logistics you guys handle. Yep. Here's our requirements, and it, so far it's worked really well for us. And are you are you uh, de deploying the same playbook on the sort of fulfillment center side as well? You're using third parties and others to pick through and and, and pack the produce for you. A little you? bit different on the fulfillment side. The fulfillment piece we own, um, and and we own and operate our own warehouses. We employ our own you know warehouse associates and labor to do that. The, the reason being, there's there's a lot of secret sauce in that. Yep. There's also like you know, real competitive. I mean, third party that. warehouses are not necessarily good at picking like right. produce and, and recombining into boxes. Right. I can see why we'd want to They're do that. They're great for storage. Yep. They're less great for, you know, and, and 
our pick and pack process is also very customized. You know, we'll have sun-kissed peppers one week, we'll have artichokes the next week. Uh, different things have to go in different boxes at different times so that the actual fulfillment process we own. And are you building your own technology, like your own effectively WMS slash picking system to, yep. to optimize these processes? Yeah, there's it's, it's a very tech-enabled backend essentially that, that we imagine. have and so the ERP system, the IMS system, the WMS, the inventory the, control the, system I would presume, right? Yeah, all of that is is homegrown and, and it all kind of ties onto our backend. So people people also get surprised because I'm like we're an engineering and product first business as well. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of team members that do that. Anybody anybody listening who's you know comes from the logistics world, I can hear them collectively screaming right now because it's it's like you've taken the the hardest problems in logistics and you're like that's those are the ones we want to solve, which is tremendously admirable. But I, I wonder you know to talk a little bit about about yourself and sort of the founder's journey. Like, yep. I, do you sleep? Do you have a co-founder? Like, what does your executive team look like? You know, yeah. how big is your overall team? Like, where in the journey are you? And I mean, you look you look like you got some sleep last night, so I congratulations yeah. on that. I, 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 uh, I'm obs I make sure I get my seven and a half hours of sleep a night. Congratulations. Uh, I, I make sure I, you know, I work out all the time. Part, part of it's like I know that you know, it's a marathon, yep. um, especially in the business we're in. This is not like a, hey, let's build it and, and, and flip it after a year. This is like a, we're in it for the long haul. Um, I see what you did there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the long haul. Um, but you know, to answer your question more directly, I'd say, we are very much so in chapter one of our journey. Yep. Um, we launched the business a year ago, 13 wow. months ago. Wow, um, that's that's further, that's further less far along than I realized. Okay, yeah, so, so you're so we've 23 been, states in, in 13 months. Yeah, so it's been, we've been growing quickly. Uh, but we, you know, we launched September 2018, so we haven't been around for that long. So it's very much so chapter one. Uh, we are still in that kind of like, you know, startup mentality resource constraint we have to be scrappy about everything we do uh, that you know that that stage of life yep. um, you know I, I started it solo but we had a tremendously helpful uh, a tremendously helpful board and early investor team that, that helped us uh, and then we have an awesome exec team now so um, you know on the op side on the marketing side on the product and engineering side I have an amazing team with me that that you know I like to say, like all the things they do, they do way better than I could do myself. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to say, it's, the things, yeah. it's great when you don't have to be the expert in everything anymore, right? right. You're no longer the CFO. I hope. I mean, maybe yeah. you, you come from finance, so you might be an excellent CFO, but yeah. at some point, you know, you got to specialize and let let the experts do what they yeah, do. Yeah, right? and I still I still stick my head in the in the meetings, and I'm like, hey, like what's going on here? I got a question about this, <laughs> this, this. But I, I generally believe that that team that you know the team that we put together they know that stuff better than i do uh which is which is I mean, hopefully the, the right place it's, to be it's the role of a founder right you yeah. build you build you build a team we talk around here about companies are just collections of people mm -hmm. and if you have the right people you win and if you have the wrong people you you probably don't yep. uh that's that's fantastic so so you're a year into this how do you you know if you could wave a magic wand, right? Like, what's the what's the vision? What's the five, ten year, or you know, your your choice of horizon? What's what's the outcome that that makes you most proud? Yeah, I mean, I think you know we're tackling two very specific and distinct problems that are related but distinct. One is um, an affordable grocery platform online. I think our thesis is that. You know, if you look at all the food delivery platforms, you look at all the you know meal kit businesses, et cetera, they're they're still premium products. They're not affordability focused. Uh, our product is you know 30, 40, 50 percent cheaper than a grocery store, and you don't have to drive. So in all, you know, the, the customer should save a tremendous amount of money by using our platform, and that's the type of customer that we're catering to. Yep. So the end goal there on the, the customer facing side is we want to be the affordable online grocery store okay. that doesn't exist today. Um, and As somebody who lives in New York City, and I won't name any, but orders from some of the more traditional online delivery groceries, it is not cheap. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're, you're, paying, you're paying a premium baked into the actual products, and then you're paying a delivery fee, a convenience fee, a fuel fee, all, all this other stuff on top yep. of it. So that's the consumer-facing journey. H however long it takes to get there, you know, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever, the ultimate goal is we're the, the affordable online grocery. Everybody in the United States. Correct. Everybody, Everybody in the US. world? Everybody in the United States. In the U.S. Okay. Well, well, yeah. we'll, start, we'll start with start reasonable ambition. Yeah, okay. We'll start with the 300 million people here. Yep. Uh, and then on the supply chain side, on the back end, it's, it's, it's the same business, but it's a different problem. Uh, we're based, we want to become the liquidation channel mm -hmm. uh, for all these perishable items. Yep. Today, like, there is no platform for suppliers, manufacturers, uh, you know, 3PLs in between to go in and liquidate stuff that 
you know, is getting wasted. Yep. And our goal, we've started to do it in produce. I think we've done a pretty good job over the past year. Now the goal is to expand beyond produce and say, what other liquidation opportunities are there? What other stuff's getting wasted? Let us, you know, take on that inventory and, and sell it to consumers and have them save money. So, all right. So you told us a little bit about your background. Yep. Um, you know, for those folks out there who are, you know, trying to start something or, or are in the, you know, an earlier stage than you. I, I'm curious to like, what advice you have for founders who are trying to get things off? What was, what was the toughest thing for you? I mean, I, I know personally that raising our seed round was the hardest thing I think I've probably ever done. And yeah. so different folks have different snag points. And, and right. I'm curious as to like where those were. And then my next question is gonna be, well, how did you get past them? But we'll, we'll right. start with the snag points first. Oh, you can tell it's fresh produce. There's an ant coming out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Ant, here you go, come over here. Okay. Don't mind me. Yep. I think I might have killed the end. Sorry, Ed. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the way I think about it is in the early days, um, and, and we're still in the early days, but right. back when I first got around, it, it was about... Early is relative. Early is relative. <laughs> it was about access to capital, access to talent, and then just jumping right in, essentially. Yep. And I think, you know, the, the capital part was is always challenging because, you know, you, you walk into a VC's office and you're like, I have an idea. Right. Give me money for it, um, and so and then you know it, that's always challenging. Put together a deck. We uh, you know had a business plan, and went and did all that. That part was challenging. Um, I, I think hiring our, our first two or three employees was prob was also incredibly challenging, just yep. because you know I had to sell them on a vision, but there's nothing else, um, right? That, that was that was <laughs> a hard part. But I'd say the the third point is probably the hardest part, okay. and it's probably the hardest part for a lot of folks who are like looking to jump in. At least you know my view is, which is actually just getting it off the ground. Yep. I think, um, you know, people, uh, th there's a tendency, especially for folks who come from my background, like the, the fi world of finance, there's a tendency for, for, for people to overanalyze sure. before jumping right in. Sure. Uh, and my view is like, you know, at the end of the day as an operator, you have to operate and you have to get in. And it's only one way to find 30, out, right? right? Um, so, you know, back when we first launched, I packed our, our first set of sets of boxes. Um, I delivered our first boxes as well. I, I rented in your, in your car drove, and I, a I rental van. And, yeah, yeah. and you know, it sounds like kind of a cliche, like you know, uh, founder operator story. But right. for you know, at the end of the day, when you're capital constrained, talent constrained, you just kind of have to dive in and go and get it off the ground and and, and start See doing it. Everybody buys, right? Sales cures all. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and so, so talk us through that. Like, how did you, like, granularly, right? Okay, you, you one day you, you presumably had this idea, and then. Right. Tell me, you know, did you think about it and then did, then did you talk to folks and then decide to leap? Like, how did you actually get from the point where, I mean, did you quit your job to like do this? Like, what what convinced you? Like, and what was that process like? Yeah, um, the quit the quit your job thing is interesting. So I, I, I didn't I didn't have a job at the time. I, I already <laughs> left, <laughs> yeah, okay. which helped, tre helped tremendously, right? Because you can't really overanalyze too much when you're like, I'm not really making money right Gotta now. Gotta put so food I, on I the table. To, exactly. Um, and even if it's misfit food, it's worth it. So. As we know, it's still equally good. Exactly. So I started by essentially going uh, going to farms. I visited probably twenty different farms okay. uh, the first few months prior to launch. Yeah. And at each farm, I was I actually purchased inventory from them because my point was like you know instead of talking the talk, let's walk the walk as well. So I went up to all these farms. Probably and I was easier like, to what? get them to talk to you too if you're buying something. I right. Think. So I was yeah. like, hey, what stuff do you have that? you're currently not selling through traditional channels. What are you not selling to farmers markets, to grocery stores, to your neighbors? Uh, and every 100% of the farms I went to had some amount of inventory that they weren't able to sell. 100% um, of the farms? All of them, all of them. And this was all presumably in the, did you start in Philly? Was that the I first market? I started in Philly, so it was Eastern Pennsylvania farms yep. Yep, and then yep, a yep. few in New Jersey, kind of okay. in the island area. And were you like skew agnostic if they were growing corn or tomatoes or onions, whatever it was, you would take it? I was, it, and it was, I was starting towards, uh, I was in, in the summer as well, which which presented some some uh, challenging logistics problems, yep. you know, temperature and produce. <laughs> but uh, so a lot of it was was you know stone fruit that had you know some some scarring on it, or you know squash or onions or you know the, the things like that, and, and that we were finding at these Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So I started buying all of this produce, uh, and essentially got to a point where I couldn't store it in my apartment, uh, and so I was like, all right, I have to get a warehouse. Yeah, uh, so we had a bit, this is becoming real. Right. So got a you know I, I rented like a eleven thousand square foot space, which was 
pretty small. Okay. And then I moved from buying case quantities to a couple pallets worth of things at a time. Uh, and then gradually sort of pushed off the ground, hired our first warehouse operations uh, person. And then then it got to a scale where and to, uh, up until this time, I was funding all I of I was going to say, was this bootstrap until this point? Yeah. This is bootstrap. OK. So the, uh, you know, the, 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 the bonuses for my finance days, I, I burned through pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, the, old and, credit, the old credit card uh, yeah, VC. Had, yep. Exactly. So I got it off the ground, bootstrapped it. And then really when I got to a point where we we actually had a meaningful amount of produce um, in our warehouse and you know, meaningful amount, number of pre-orders that, that we had launched with for Misfit Market. On the customer side, I was like, now we need to raise capital and do this. Uh, went, went out to, uh, to a bunch of VCs. Fortunately, you know, because I worked in finance uh, previously, I had a, a decent network when it yep. came to investors. Uh, and probably a pretty area. good perspective on what they would be looking for Correct. in an early stage company. Exactly. So getting getting our seed round done was it was challenging, but it wasn't as challenging probably as uh, as one would expect because we, you know, I had I had that network already. At what point? Uh, well, I guess a couple of things. You mentioned the sort of the supply side. Uh, did you do that first or did you do the demand side first? Did you do them in parallel? And like when you yeah. started thinking about customers, was it, was it, it, was it physically? Did you go out and sell people? Was it digital and, you know, using marketing? Like, how did you go about that? Yeah, we, we tackled both at the same time. Okay. Um, the idea was that, you know, we needed to, to validate the, the supply side problem for sure um, to make sure there was this stuff out there and that we could buy it, uh, you know, cheaper than grocery stores. Right. And then we also need to validate the demand side because you know, if we have a bunch of misfit produce but no one wants to buy it, that's an issue as well. Sounds like you want a lot of inventory that's expiring, right? right? Yeah. So we, we did both at the same time. Uh, we had a very simple uh, storefront online and you could okay. go, but we didn't do anything in person. One of our, one of our core philosophies also is that you know, we are eliminating a ton of overhead by eliminating the entire like physical infrastructure that a traditional grocery chain has a brick and mortar store. Yep. Um, so there's no in-person sales. There's no, you know, brick and mortar store. Everything's digital. Um, so we put up our website and we, we basically kind of like told the story, hired a designer to say, to kind of express what our brand was about, yep. um, told the story and pre-order started coming in. I mean, and, it's effectively like from a supply chain perspective, it looks like pure play e-com too, right? Like you're right. removing touches. It's just inbound and outbound and that's that's Correct. it, right? I mean, you're not doing any uh, intra-network moves or anything like that. Is, nope. is Actually, that's a good question. Is the produce you sell, is, I would think, right? Is it all sourced locally then? Like from it's, the same market? There's a lot that's local. There's also stuff that's that's from other parts of the country because we, okay. we're at a point now where we carry, you know, uh, in a given two week time frame, we probably carry like 200 different types of produce. Um, so even in the dead of the winter in Boston, Massachusetts, we can right. make sure that we're getting someone a good box of fresh produce, which means it's not being- It's grown. coming from South America or something like that, right? It's coming from California, Florida usually. Right, okay. Um, or, or, or like I think of cherries grow in Washington state. If you right. live in Florida, well, that may not be a market, but if you live in a market that, that is a misfits market, See what I did there. Uh, you can order fruit that is not necessarily locally grown. Yep, that's exactly. That's, man, and I'll then, and then we basically route all of that uh, to our warehouse. We sort through it. We we do a lot of quality checks on that product as well. I'm just sure because if we're getting misfit, pro you know, there's a, a crucial difference between misfit and rotting or moldy right. or whatever it is. So we, we do a lot of quality checks, and then we make sure that you know we, we pack down the boxes. I, I was going to say like that, that that leads to other interesting questions, right? Like what I would be curious, like and obviously I don't know what what degree you're comfortable sharing these kind of numbers, but like yeah. what percentage of the food that you buy do you throw out? Yeah. If it's forty percent in the larger market, like what's one derivative of that? It's, look like? uh, it's a very small percentage okay. that, that we throw out. Usually, it's stuff that. Um, is is so damaged that it's not fit for human consumption. It's not fit what for What we anybody. actually did was, uh, well, it is fit for uh, for pigs. So what we actually do okay. is we have partnered with um, okay. with, a, with a pig farmer okay. that has like 250 pigs. This sounds like the start of a joke. Yeah, <laughs> no, 250 pigs. Okay. Uh, and uh, every couple weeks, like whatever uh, stuff that we have that we can't, that, that is bad or rotten yep. or, or smush or whatever it is, uh, we essentially put that in, in a bunch of giant bins and we send it to the pigs. Do they pay for it? Uh, they don't. Well, yeah. that's all right. At least, yeah. at least it's not going not to waste, waste, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Free, I mean, free pig food, yeah. I mean, I would think, you know, you, you mentioned the phrase before, and, and as somebody who's only tangentially yep. involved with the food supply chain, I've more recently become aware of this this concept of, of food deserts. And and somebody who's, you know, uh, fortunately and bluntly lucky like me, I've, I've probably never lived in a food desert, so I, I haven't experienced that. But the notion that there are places where you literally, to your point, just can't get healthy food, uh, I mean, that's, that's, you know, obviously very concerning. Are you, 
are you doing anything from like a like a, are you donating any of the food? Does anybody get like free memberships? Is there any sort of like community aspect of the platform yeah. like that? It's 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 a crazy number. There's tw there's 20 million people in the U.S. that are in in census designated 20 to 30 million that are formerly in census designated food deserts, urban. So that's rural. 10 percent of the population. Massive, right? yeah. And that and that's and that's like formal food deserts. And there are you know if you're 30 minutes away from a grocery store or something like that, you know you probably don't. That doesn't count as a food desert. Exactly. Wow. Oh, so boy. there's there's a lot of different places. Uh, and, and a huge number of people. So we do two things. Um, one of them is in the works, one we do. One is um, we donate to local food banks. Okay. Uh, so we work with a couple in Philly, work with one in New York and uh, in the city, and essentially the stuff that is uh, not going to the pigs that uh, you know we're buying in excess, and if it's like really small quantities of something that we're not putting into our boxes, we're donating that through a food bank yep. program that we have. Um, and then the other longer term initiative that we're working on right now is accepting uh, SNAP EBT. Food stamps. Oh wow! So that is a uh, a, a long and, and arduous process. There's going to be process. a lot of compliance on the on the federal side. To accept One of the those, issues right? is that a lot of the organizations that are uh, that are behind the ability to accept food stamps are, you know, somewhat old school, for yep. lack of a better term, <laughs> uh, and and they don't. Ex online retailers cannot accept SNAP EBT, even if they're affordable. You have to be a physical brick and mortar store. Um, so we're we're actually doing some policy related work right now and then some work with local partners to figure out a way to, to, to make that happen because the truth is, you know, no matter how cheap uh, you know our food is, if if there's someone who's using food stamps exclusively to to buy food, they can't spend money outside right. some, of Right. Some something stamps. counts something is more right. than free, right? Exactly. And, and that I would think uh, it's 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 fascinating to hear that you're already doing some public policy stuff because you know relatively speaking a year in yeah. most folks are not you know turning their eye outwardly yet like that. I, my my guess is um, especially local politicians will will absolutely love this. I yeah. mean they, 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 this sounds like the kind of thing that they they could uh, not only you know get behind you know philosophically but for their constituents. Yep. Um, Drive tremendous value. Yeah, we're so working on that. It's it's a it'll be a, a long process. But. I mean, it, it always is when uh, when those outside entities get involved. Yeah. The the thing that you know that I'm sure at least some of our audience is you know more supply chain focused is thinking about. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with FISMA, uh, which is the you know the Food Safety Regulatory Act. Like just yep. when you start taking on produce or just operating in the food supply chain in general, especially you know raw food. It's not a frozen dinner or something like that. How do you think about both, I guess, safety and you know the sort of other side of the coin of safety is liability. Like, yep. how do you how do you manage these things? How do you protect, obviously, your customers, uh, but frankly, also yourself as you think about your own business? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is having the right processes and protocols in place. And you know, we because we deal with food, we have FISMA, we have USDA, we have FDA, we have a ton of different regulatory entities and and protocols we have to follow. Yep. Um, and and I don't come from a food world, right? Right. And so the you know my strategy on that has been we hired some extremely talented people okay. who have implemented these processes across food companies, like dozens of food companies in the past. Uh, and they've essentially come in over the past year, uh, made sure that we're doing all that stuff. So like right, you know, right temperature control for things. You know, we currently just do organic, but if we ever do organic and conventional, you know, how to separate that product in the right yep. ways, uh, making sure that um, you know, there's different temperature zones for different types of produce, making sure that, you know, if there is a recall, um, yep. you know, there hasn't been for us that has affected us, but if there has been, yep. uh, if there is a recall, what do you do? Um, you know, you have to be able to identify the affected customers within 24 hours and or 48 hours and let them know. So um, we have pretty robust processes in place for all of that now. That's, that's fantastic. It, one of the things I, I, we were talking off camera, I, I love about your business because it's, you know, it reminds me of ours is when you can take and, and ultimately monetize something that would otherwise be thrown out or, or lost, that, yep. that, that creates a win-win for, for everybody. But it, it's also, it's interesting because what you also just said, it, it also resonated with me. Like, uh, the the sort of higher the expertise that you need to combine with you know which is it sounds more traditional right you're not right. changing the the sort of food safety process you're changing the food delivery process and things like that how have you thought about and has it been a struggle or has it been an opportunity uh, sort of the sort of cultural combination or mashup of those who would be attracted to a a startup and, and all yeah. the things that come along with that with the folks who are probably more used to operating in what I would call much more granular and, and perhaps messy, more traditional environments. How do yeah. you bring those together? It's interesting and it's something I've thought about a lot recently because our team today is 50% like startup tech um, you know, background and, and DNA and 50% 
like food company DNA. Sounds exactly, it sounds exactly right? like our and, business. And I think, you know, we have, so far we've created somewhat organically this culture that blends the two together. And, uh, you know, the, the, the startup and tech people know that they're not necessarily food experts and the food experts know that they're not startup and tech and, and you, know, uh, you know, software experts, but we've been able to kind of like blend those two worlds. Everybody, together. everybody plays nicely everyone together. Everyone plays nicely and everyone knows that, you know, hey, like if you have a question about FISMA, you're not going to the engineering team and uh, you know, you're, 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 you're going to these folks over here that have done this for the past 30 years. Um, so we've created an interesting culture there. Uh, we found that 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 absolutely to me the best answer is not what the at least the way we would say it it's not what the freight guys come up with and it's not what the logistics or the tech guys come up with it's what we can come up with together if we get in a room for an, for an hour and argue about it right and um, I think that's that's also that's 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 the opportunity here right? right it's like it's this idea and it's probably the case for for, for you guys as well is you know, no one has been able to marry those two worlds together effectively to date, right? Because it's, it, it's hard, right? Like, I mean, human nature yeah. is to blame the other guy and like, right. oh, that person was, you know, dumb or whatever it might be. And the reality is most people are, are pretty good at what they do. It's the, it's the connectivity points that, right. that create all the challenge. So we were, we were talking about uh, building out the executive team and not yep. being able to do every job. I'm, I'm curious as to a couple of questions about that. Yep. What, what came first? Uh, if it's a different question, which one do you think was the most important uh, and which one was the hardest to hire? Interesting. Yeah, I, I would say, so my approach, and you know, I don't necessarily know if it's the right approach, my approach so far has been in the early days, we really valued like generalists who are yep. good at a lot of different things. And so, uh, you know, the, the first hire that we made was someone who, you know, could do customer service, could uh, write a little bit of code, uh, could, um, you know, do some of the warehouse operations, okay. could manage hiring a bunch of people off Craigslist, a lot of different things. That's right? very scrappy. It's almost like a mini, like a, a mini co-founder. Mini GM. Right? Or a mini yeah, GM yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and that, I think that, that was a crucial first hire And for how us. did you find that person, especially with such a varied skill set? Yeah, um, it was a lot of like outbound searching and okay. then that person also, I think, had heard of something that I was trying to do and okay. so it was... So it wasn't of, somebody you knew or anything like that and it wasn't even somebody you were introduced to, at least no. not immediately. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So, so that, you know, that person allowed us to kind of like get a lot of this off of the ground originally and, and, and kind of served as, as a thought partner for me. Very cool. Um, and then... You know, since then, I think we've, we're still early, but yeah. we've kind of created uh, sort of specialized lanes. And, and after that, it's become, okay, like we need a product leader who can really think about our e-commerce product and help build that out. We need an engineering leader who's solely focused on all the, the products we're building internally and, and the engineering scale. We need- So that, that's a good one right there. Yeah. What came first, product or engineering? The chicken uh, and the egg. Engineering came first. Engineering first. came first because you can draw it all day long, but if you can't yeah, build it, exactly. you're not going to get it. We just far. needed someone to build, yep. uh, to handle, you know, and we scaled quickly from zero to, you know, 60,000 customers in, 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 uh, in 10 months. So we needed, we needed engineers to, to sort of scale that back in for us, et cetera. And yep. then, then we need a product person to come in and organize all of those pieces. Yep. Uh, and then the operation side for us was really, uh, really crucial just because it, like I said before, it's an ops and logistics business. Right. So, you know, we had to, we had to hire a procurement team and someone to build that out. Um, I, I hired a COO recently. who was a super, super talented thought partner okay. of mine who actually helped build out the entire ops team. So I didn't have to build out the op team. Yep. I just had to hire him. Yep. Uh, and then he built out the op team. <laughs> Funny how that works, long. right? Um, and, and I think those, those key team members that bring a tremendous amount of leverage at them, those are the really important ones for, yep. for us at least, because essentially that one hire resulted in 30 other hires. They have the cascade uh, effect. And down they could just there. handle it all, as opposed to like me making 31 hires. And what, which was the toughest one to find the person? Um, I mean, we know they're all tough, but yeah, like. Yeah, they're, they're all tough. Uh, I would say I probably spent the most time and effort uh, finding our, 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 our head of our, our COO. Our head of our COO. And that's probably the most senior person other than you that you've hired. Exactly. Especially given the nature of our business. Um, you know, someone who's handled food at scale, someone who's optimized all the logistics at scale, someone who, um, you know, someone who also has experience with kind of like a modern sort of consumer facing operation yeah. as well. And, and, you know, pick to pack and scaling that. That was a tough one. Did they come from a specifically a logistics background or more of a food background? Uh, both actually. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Last question. Yeah. What keeps you up at night? It's a good one. Um, Every I, I being from the journey myself, I know all of us have some degree of existential terror that we don't always share, and we just you know it's part of the founder's burden. Yeah. What 
What's like the most acute thing for you? What 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 really makes you shake? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it goes back to sort of the people thing we were talking yep. about before. Um, we're growing so quickly; our, our our rate of growth is so rapid right now that you know all these new roles pop up all the time, and I feel like we're constantly hiring. And eighty percent of my time is spent on the hiring side of things. So you know, if there's one thing that keeps me up at night, it's like. Am I good enough at hiring? Am I hiring the right people? Am I putting them in the right position? Have I created the right sort of structure for the different teams to communicate with each other? Um, the right piping, like that—that that is what I think about a lot. All the messiness. Um, all the messes. At the end of the day, like you said before, uh, these startups—they are nothing but uh, the people that you hire and decisions they make. Um, and we kind of have to make sure that we're hiring the right people and that we're creating the right infrastructure and the right to make the right decisions. Um, so that's probably the biggest one. It's a hell of a story, man. It's a hell of a company. Thank you. Wish you nothing but luck. Thanks. Thanks.